Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first panel discussion of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. The topic of this panel is rivers, water, and life. So without further ado, we'll pass the word to Satyokwan, who will give the opening address. Tonchitovanuhola <laughs> Onanoa <laughs> Nyantakasatsalagi <laughs> ne Nagin <laughs> Anskajindituahuetnuninanguanigula <laughs> Anskanti <laughs> Yotka <laughs> Don't 
the Hodisla Ted and only Gene Elo Awayasta Nescano Giacodunha Tandi, Nagino Hogas and Guan Toa Jim Guatet the Gelo, a Tony Dot in Guanigula. A Scandi to a wet nun, you know, Guanigula done at the Tinuhulato, Nagini Gailo, and the Lehun down from Dani Gula, Nagaho Gila Gelo, and the Dusta Tena, and the Lat Sloxa, who on a Dawayatum. Najunke Hilaqua Ginio Chiloel, and Ned Dian Dualian and Gwesua, a Tony Dot in Guanigula. Una no es no hay ti te voy a una ni halatne, ne chino es todo de no que la guani no es un guay tizo. Yo te no me ha neto y te gato ni no le hago eco. Ay, le es un guano no con el chiseco y el guio da que genio chiseco le fue en la cua. Chino ho tan son los un ne chino un jade. Andi te voy a ver ando es no es ando voy a ver una ye la te. Isi na kumun, kumun ya di. Neca ti wahi andi te voy a ver una gano hola dun sala. Es tan ya doak ni guani gula. On a noe, your head to a way near your head. On the dolly one for Dungo, Gino Hot Dancer with the one out Dunyo. Yaki, they were getting good money to get no hot dogs and get no hodges away. That's who get net on a what for the fire and aqua, a diesel hot car when they got no hot dunk cellar. They turn it dark and go on. I just wanted to do a quick opening for everybody. Um, it's the words that come before all else, the Ohan de Galihua Dekwa. And we start this before we do all matters, it's to help bring together everybody uh, under one mind, um, Scott Nibuna, and it's to help remind everybody present that even though we have things going on in our, in our lives personally or professionally, maybe you had a bad day or things aren't going well, or you're just distracted, this is to kind of bring us all back together and to acknowledge all of creation that we all depend on all these things and we start from the ground up. Um, you know, we even acknowledge one another and that we stay open-minded and peaceful. Um, then we go from our mother earth, that she still carries us and provides everything that we need to sustain us. Um, we move to the waters, which are very important, which we will be talking about today. Um, all the different types of waterways, the rains, the mists, the waterfalls, um, the rivers, the lakes. Um, then we go into the fish and how they sustain us and clean the waters um, to the different plants, whether they be medicine, um, grasses, foods, our gardens, the trees. Um, then we go to the top of the trees and there's the birds. Um, that they still carry their songs and lighten our hearts and our spirits. Um, the four winds, the sun, our brother the sun, that he still shines his light to help things grow and that he provides us warmth and strength. Our grandmother moon, that she still, um, that she still shines down on us. The stars that help mark our way when we get lost. Um, the four beings and um, Wyatt is our creator. And, you know, if there was anything else that I missed, I didn't mean to cause any harm, but um, if there was something I missed, then it's for everybody else to give thanks in their own way. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So now. My name is Blake Lavia. And my name is Simu Aguilar Itzo. And on behalf of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit, we want to thank all our participating partners. The people, the organizations, the land and the water that helped make this summit possible. We also want to acknowledge the funders who also made these events happen. We want to thank New York Humanities, the National Endowment of the Humanities, the St. Lawrence University Arts Collaborative Grant, and the Richard F. Brush Art Gallery. And this specific event is happening in tandem 
with the Richard F. Brash Gallery's exhibition, Water and Origin, honoring and protecting the first storyteller. And finally, we will pass you to the moderator of this panel, the moderator of Rivers, Water and Life, Sandhya. Thank you. Um, thank you to Sateo Kwan for sharing those words with us. And thank you also to Sinsun and Blake for organizing and facilitating this entire summit, the, the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit. Um, I'm Sandhya Ganapati. I'm the moderator and um, I'm an assistant professor of global studies at St. Lawrence University. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone, uh, welcome our panelists, um, welcome to all of those um, out there joining us on Zoom uh, and through the Weave News. Um, you know, welcome to this inaugural event of the North Country Art, Land and Environment Summit and this particular roundtable on um, rivers, water and life. Before we proceed, we must begin by acknowledging the lands and waters which make all of this possible, the traditional territory of Haudenosaunee peoples. We must also acknowledge the historical and ongoing violence that's been enacted upon these lands and waters and upon Haudenosaunee people. And it is the consequence of this violence that makes this conversation necessary. And I wanna speak for a moment just from my own position as, as a settler, as a non-Indigenous person who now calls this area home. Um, and I think about how I am challenged to reflect on how so many of the institutions and organizations that I take for granted, that I sort of participate um, and on a regular basis, uh, the institutions and organizations that also have helped to make this event possible, how they are also built upon Haudenosaunee lands. And in that way, they are also linked to this violence. Um, and so this is a contradiction that I have to grapple with and that I think about um, as I try to better understand this place that I now call home. And so I would like to welcome other people who were positioned similarly as I am to do the same, to sort of grapple with these contradictions. Um, for me, it's part of a learning process. It's part of a learning process, you know, to learn more about this place I call home, um, as well as part of a process of working towards a more just, regenerative, life-giving and life-sustaining future. And so this panel discussion, this conversation, is a, is a part of that process. Well, let's get started. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words about how we're going to organize this. Um, um, so essentially what we will do, um, I'm going to start with just uh, some prefacing remarks to contextualize the conversation. Um, and then we'll do some quick introductions for each of the panelists. So each of the panelists will introduce themselves and say a few words about themselves. Then we will turn to their presentation. So each of the panelists has prepared, a, you know, a five to seven minute long presentation that they will share with us. And then we'll have time for conversation and discussion. And to begin, I'll, I'll just share some brief prefacing remarks to help contextualize this conversation within the contemporary moment that we all find ourselves in. Um, so our conversations are going to center primarily on the St. Lawrence River watershed. But this summit opens at a time of broad-based public reckonings. Um, reckonings that have been in the making for several years and, and quite frankly for several centuries. Most recently, we can see this in the devastating impacts of COVID-19, which is especially pronounced in marginalized, minoritized, impoverished communities. Uh, we can also see this in the global mobilizations in support of Black Lives. Um, we can see this in the ongoing efforts of Standing Rock water protectors to secure the health, the water, and the lands of Oshetishakoin peoples. We see this in the efforts of 
community organizers and public health activists in Flint, Michigan, um, trying to get some redress for the poisoning of the Flint River and then the subsequent poisoning of people, many of whom are children. Um, and so what all of these seemingly separate disparate reckonings have in common is that they reveal some of the failures of colonizing society and the dangers that it poses for water and for life. But at the same time, at the time where at the same time where all these reckonings are happening, people also continue to live and continue to engage with their social and natural worlds, with land, with water, with each other. And the purpose of this panel is to reflect more pointedly on the various ways that people engage with the waters of the St. Lawrence River watershed and to reflect on the water's life-giving possibilities. Um, the panelists all come from very different lived experiences, cultural traditions, forms of expertise, um, and they will speak about their relationships with the waters of of these Haudenosaunee territories of the Kanyakahaga Mohawk people. Um, and then we will also reflect on the future. So how we can work towards more sustainable, just, and life-giving futures. And so with that, I'd like to turn to our panelists. And so I think I will just go um, in the order that I have you listed, um, and just for a brief introduction, and then we'll turn to the presentations. So, Yagoni Goliosta, would you mind introducing yourself? Sure. Um, Yagoni Goliosta, you get, uh, which means she makes them have good thoughts. I I'm very happy to be here tonight, and I work for the Akwesasne Museum. Um, we're in Akwesasne, and we are, are we're dedicated to sharing our culture with our, our community that um, maybe just becoming aware of our culture and uh, neighboring communities and our visiting public. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Jessica, uh, Jessica Joke. Yes, hi, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel and discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm Jessica Jock. I was born and raised here in the North Country, grew up swimming in the St. Lawrence River, and um, I have a background in environmental science and engineering, and I've worked for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division for 18 years on some of the, the waterways here that um, are specific to the Aquasasti Mohawk Territory. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next, Sete uh, Yokuan. Every single time. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. My name is Satyokwa. I'm Snipe Clan. I was born and raised here in Akwazasne. I love to put my Zoom on mute and start talking. I, <laughs> I also um, have my own business called Snipe Clan Botanicals, where I create um, plant-based products that I make out of things that um, I grow or pick in the wild and um, just try to provide those products for people in Akwazasna and also to teach them how to use that. I also work with Jessica Jock as her traditional ecological knowledge um, as a consultant for as traditional ecological knowledge um, for the St. Regis Tribes Environment Division. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Lee Wilbanks. Hi, thanks, Sandy. I, I'd like to start by just uh, saying I think we should all thank uh, Talking Wings, uh, Sinsun, and Blake for the uh, incredible amount of work and passion they brought to bringing this together. Um, I'm very honored to be a part of this and, and to be on this panel with everybody else from whom I've already learned quite a bit in our practice sessions. Uh, I am, uh, I guess, an itinerant environmental advocate, uh, uh, currently uh, not employed by any environmental organization, but uh, working with several uh, community organizations, uh, unfortunately, 
some of them in Canada where uh, it's no longer possible to visit in person, but uh, uh, working through organizational and uh, issue related uh, topics with them. Uh, and uh, I'm also a counsel to the New York State uh, Tug Hill Commission, which serves a, an area just uh, to the west of the Adirondacks and the east of Lake Ontario. Thank you, Lee. Um, and unless we have Shane Rogers. Hello, thank you. Uh, like Lee, I'm, I'm thankful to be here tonight. Uh, I think this, uh, the idea behind this is uh, very powerful and meaningful, especially in the time that we live in these days. Uh, I'm a professor of environmental engineering at Clarkson University. And uh, I, I come here via Iowa and in Cincinnati. I worked for the US EPA for a number of years there uh, before coming here. I'm also the owner of a small consulting firm. I do uh, recently expert witnessing and, and uh, working with, uh, with people who need help really uh, in dealing with environmental pollution issues and their impacts on their own public health. Um, and I try to do work globally, uh, you know, bringing access to needed resources uh, of people, uh, including water and those sorts of things. And I guess, uh, my, my best connection to the place here, I think, uh, my funnest connection is that I'm also a, a musician with an indie rock band, the Bee Children, uh, and we're, we're local here. And so I really enjoy the area and, and the unique aspects that are up here that uh, I, I don't have anywhere else in the world. And so very happy to be here and joining the panel. Thank you, Shane. Um... So again, welcome to all of our panelists. And, and so I want to jump right in. And I, I think I'd like to start with uh, Yagoni, Yagoni Goliosta, um, our, our first speaker. I was asked to, to be part of it because they were looking for artists who would um, express themselves or express their culture through their art. And um, I'm an, I, I make quilts. And what I've been able to do over the years was to be able to tell stories with my quilts. And when um, I, uh, Blake and Su Tsing come, came to the museum, they asked me to make, help them get in contact with other artists in the community to, who also had shared the culture that, that um, we have here in the community. I was able to get them involved with a, a couple of the artists and hopefully some of the pieces you'll see at, at um, the museum in, in Canton. Um, one of the films that they're going to show, uh, I think they'll be starting it really soon, is uh, a, a little video of the um, quilt that I made. Um, what they had asked me to do was to think about um, water and origin and that was actually very easy to do because in our creation story, um, at the beginning of the world, the whole world was covered in water. There was nothing else. There was no, um, there was not even light. There was no land. And, and when you think of what that would look like, that is what took my uh, inspiration for this quilt. In the beginning, the sky woman falls from the sky and she is coming to a new world to start a whole new creation. She falls from the sky, and as she's falling from the sky, the waterfall will look up and they see that she is coming down, and they worry for her, and they want to be able to catch her in their wings and slowly bring her down into the earth. And they are really concerned that uh, there is no place for her to land. And so they hold her on their wings while the water animals get together and they have a little council and they decide that the best thing for her is to be able to land on the turtle's back because the turtle is bigger than all the other animals. So she lands on the turtle's back and the animals are concerned that the turtle's back is a little bit hard and so it would be nice if they could bring up some soil from the bottom of the sea that they know exists down there and if they're able to do that, it would make her to be able to walk on the earth in, in a much softer place. So the beaver and um, 
um, the otter tried to go down there and to try to get some of the soil, but they're not able to do that. They basically give up. And it's the muskrat, the small muskrat, who, who has so much determination and says, uh, I'm going to be able to do it. He, he goes down, he goes all the way to the, to the bottom, and he's able to get some of the soil in his hands. And he brings that up, um, he brings that up to um, the surface. Unfortunately, his efforts took him so long that he had no longer any breath, and basically he was, he was not alive anymore. But the, the beaver goes, and he um, takes from the from the muskrat's hands some of the soil that um, that is in his hands, and he hands it to um, Sky Woman. And Sky Woman takes that. She gives thanks for everything that that um, the animals and the birds do, and she begins to sing. And when she sings, um, when she sings, she also dances. And she puts the soil on the ground. And when she puts it on the ground, um, she's, as she dances, she dances in the same direction that we still do today. And I guess you would say that, that it goes in this direction, not the other way. Um, and, and the soil and the turtle's back begin to enlarge. And the more she dances, the further out she goes, the bigger that gets. And today, our people still call this Turtle Island um, because we are on the turtle's back. In the quilt that you saw a few seconds ago, I imagine that there is only the waterfowl and the water animals and a few of the other spirits that were here prior to the making of the world that saw that. And I tried to see it through their eyes. And that's the vision that you got in that in that quilt. Um, why was that important to me to do that quilt? Well, it was important, especially because I grew up in the city in Syracuse, and um, we were very close to any water, um, except Onondaga Creek, and, which is a small little creek that went through Syracuse. And it wasn't until I, I, I was fully grown and I came to Akwesasne that I was really able to enjoy water on a constant um, basis. <clears throat> I met my husband and we, we had a family and we lived on the river. We still live on the river. <clears throat> His family owns land on both sides of the river. And so we're constantly going back and forth. And I used to um, go across the bridge, both bridges, um, many times, many times, uh, a few times a day sometimes. And I love the river. It was beautiful. Um, you could see for miles if you look down the river. But um, I was really concerned because what you could also see is dump tar, which was polluting our lands. And, and put out a terrible smell. And GM, which was right next door to us, and we knew that they were putting dioxin and Myrex and, and um, different chemicals into the water. And then you had Reynolds Metals right there. And when I came to Akwesasne, I was one of the founders of the Freedom School. And the Freedom School that we started was right next to the, to the GM plant. And so we moved about a mile away. But still, um, to go in and out from the Freedom School, you had to pass the GM plant. And one of the the terrifying things of the GM plant, especially in the afternoon, was that they had a water tower that was pretty huge. And so what you would see is you would see this uh, shadow of the water tower. And for some reason, it always looked like a cobra. And I think there's a reason that it looked like a cobra is because they were, um, they were poisoning our people. Um, well, while we were on Racket Point, um, it became very clear that um, the poisoning that they were doing was not only in the water, it was in the air. And um, we were warned that farming was not a good idea. And at the time we had cows and we had pigs and, and chickens and we, we planted, um, we had a nice farm going. And um, they said that uh, you could only uh, keep your cows for two years because some of the fluoride coming out of Reynolds would um, deteriorate their teeth to such a point that it was painful for them. And so you had to basically kill them and um, you know, use their meat at that time. Um, so it was, it was pretty sad. It, it, it came, a uh, big change in lifestyle happened for a lot of people. A lot of people gave, gave up farming and then, so I was just like, why are we living here? Why are we living in this pollution? If I'm having, I had so many beautiful children, why am I exposing them to this kind of um, pollution? So I, 
I um, joined a group, uh, Tommy Porter um, was uh, working on trying to get some land down in Mohawk Valley and move people down to the valley and start over. And, and uh, we were going to have this traditional community. So I helped him. I even went down there and um, helped look at some of the land that they were looking at. And I tried to convince my husband to go with me and bring our children down there. And he listened for a while, considered it for a long time. And then he just looked at me and he said, no, I'm not going anywhere. And I, and I was, what do you mean you're not going anywhere? I said, it's all polluted here. We can't farm anymore. I said, why would we stay here? And he said, I grew up here. My people are buried here. My family is buried here. And he said, um, everything that I know is here. And I would rather stay here and help to clean the community, help to get us back to where we used to be, than to go somewhere else and start over. And so I still had a hard time with it. So one day he said, come on, let's go for a ride. And I thought we were gonna go for a ride in the car, maybe go back across the bridges again. And he said, he, he instead took a turn and we went down to the river and we got in a boat and we went around Cornwall Island, we went around uh, St. Regis Island, Yellow Island, we went down to Sny. It was so beautiful. It was so refreshing. It was so magical. I have to say it's, it was magical, romantic. It was everything. It was a beautiful day. The wind was so nice. And by the, that evening, the sun was coming down. And if anybody knows about how beautiful the sunset is on the St. Lawrence River, they know what I'm talking about. And by then, I was just, I had seen homesteads, many homesteads we passed. I could see um, where the graveyards were. I could see places of worship. I saw um, fields that people had. And I just fell in love with Akwazasmi in a way that I could never fall in love with it from the land. And I knew how he felt and why it was more important for us to stay and try to to do something positive. And one of those positive things is to make sure that the Akwazasmi Freedom School would continue to thrive. Um, luckily for me, staying here meant many things. And one of the things that um, the St. Lawrence River helped me with is that the St. Lawrence River is a very, very powerful river. Um, the people who settled here know it was powerful because they harnessed the power of that river by putting in the dams. Unfortunately, when they did that, they, um, they also truncated some of the power of the rapids. The rapids are were, that used to be here, that Akwazasmi was named for. The Akwazasmi means um, land where the partridge drums and that, um, that partridge drumming is also the sound of, that the rapids used to make. Well, they don't make that sound anymore, but the, um, the river still gives off the medicine that those rapids used to bring for us. The water itself going through the rapids was a medicine and people could use that to cleanse and help to, to um, heal themselves. So um, uh, my time is up, but thank you for, for um, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicole Liostra. Um, I think now we will hear from um, Jessica Jock. Yes, thank you. And I'm so grateful to go after Cherie because <clears throat> she um, has inspired me in so many ways professionally and listening to her story again and uh, really hearing the power of, of the water, of, of the cleansing, the revitalization, the cultural appreciation of the Mohawk people is, is real important. I do work for the St. Regis Mohawk Tribes Environment Division, and I based most of my career on focusing on the St. Lawrence River area of concern. And to present some context for the viewers, um, when we talk about Haudenosaunee territory and the different, the different nations that, that make up the Haudenosaunee communities, I, I took this figure from online, hoping that it could maybe just help give some perspective. Although today we'll probably be talking uh, mostly about the Akwazasne Mohawk community from my perspective and my work. Um, I did want to note that there are other Mohawk communities um, downstream near Montreal, Ganawage. They, um, they are near the Bahanwar Dam. And so when we're talking about the different impacts to water, 
the water of uh, Haudenosaunee communities, you know, a lot of the the impacts have come from either hydro dams or industrial activities and discharges. And up here, um, upstream in Lake Ontario, the Bay of Quinte, you have the Tandanega Mohawk community. And if you look throughout the rest of the New York State, you see Onondagas down here and most of the other communities, Seneca, Tuscarora, they're on waters, uh, Niagara River, Buffalo River, Buffalo Creek. And in the work that I do, um, under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, there's been areas that have been identified as toxic hotspots historically. And <clears throat> these toxic hotspots, when looking at some of those impairments that Sheree was just mentioning, even, even the visual of the, the, the air plumes uh, that, that were coming from the industrial discharge. Um, so we here are on the St. Lawrence River and we are part of a binational area of concern throughout the Great Lakes. Uh, the, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement was a binational agreement between US and Canada that you can see all the spots on the map here. But also what I wanted to point out because some of the focus is on Haudenosaunee communities and, and water and the significance of, of waterway lice. The Bay of Quinte, I just pointed in the previous map, that's where uh, Tandanega, the Mohawk community is. And then some of these other 18 Mile Creek, Buffalo River, Niagara River, these are all contaminated areas of concern also on Haudenosaunee or near Haudenosaunee territory or traditional territory. But if we were to focus just on the St. Lawrence River area of concern, this hopefully provides a little bit better context to some of the conversation today. You know, we had just heard about the, the realization of the beauty of the, the St. Lawrence River in Aquasasne around Cornwall Island here, St. Regis Island, Yellow Island. And what this map depicts is in all the shaded area in this blue, this blue area, this is the upstream boundary by Long Sioux Island of what we're calling our area of concern on the St. Lawrence River. And these are all upstream boundaries as well. And then all of this water is considered impacted. But you see the shaded area in the colors and this represents the Mohawk territory. And so when you have a discussion about any of the Messina industry, you just heard mention of the General Motors site, the former Reynolds Metal, Alcoa East, the former Alcoa West, now Arconic. You know, these are all the Messina uh, contributing plants. There were also a number of industrial sources in the city of Cornwall on the Canadian side also. And so basically what you have in this visual here is you see that Aquasasne is downwind and down current of both Canadian and US industrial sources. And so there's, there's that, that significance in terms of <clears throat> The, the sovereign territory, but, but also what does that mean for protectiveness of cultural uses of the river, the waters? And, and what does that mean to, from a Mohawk perspective rather than a regulatory perspective or a non-indigenous person who may use the water and the, the fish and the animals differently? I, I always love hearing the Ahodengali Wadekwa and the, the creation story again, because it helps put that in perspective. So when we're monitoring the environment, you know, we're also looking at all of those, the animals, the turtles, the, the beaver, the muskrat, the, the different waters and, and the fish that, that are acknowledged in those, in those oral traditions and the traditional teachings. So one last thing I just wanted to mention on this, the Lower Grass River, it is in the shading that, that indicates that it's traditional use area. But basically, they're all protected by treaties, federal treaties that through different negotiations over time with the state and not the federal government had had a different transaction with land. So the Lower Grass River is one of our primary Superfund sites, and I'll be talking about it in a little bit. Um, but it's currently being remediated right now from industrial pollution sources. So with giving a little context also, we're talking about rivers of the past, present, and future. You know, one thing to keep in mind, we, we were talking, you know, about this area in particular, if we were to focus in on Aquasasne, 
and not the other Haudenosaunee communities, but these islands have been significant places in the traditional pathways of canoe routes, uh, migration routes. And so there's archeological evidence all throughout the islands of the St. Lawrence River. It's not just specific here, but it is through the whole St. Lawrence River of indication of pre-contact sites. So a lot of times the perspective of, of some scientists is, or others is to focus on the present, but to understand how the, the rivers, the water and the land was used you know, we, we want to we want to factor that in as well. And so, you know, there are some sites on those islands that are as old as 10,000 years old. One of the sites in Quebec that was just, I don't know if it's even on this map, it's probably somewhere around here, I think. It's in the Dundee land claims, which is part of Mohawk traditional territory. Also, this village that was found, it's been renovated and revitalized for for public access actually, and it's a very cool site if anybody has a chance to get to it. But it just again, identifies the past use of the river by Haudenosaunee people or what, what in a historical term is being identified as St. Lawrence Iroquoian people. So if we talk about again, water resources from a past fur trade, beaver, muskrat, otter, everything that was talked about in the, the, in the beginning with Sky Woman creation story, the logging industry had impacts on the rivers and the streams um, in terms of fish passage, different fishing piers that indigenous people used, you know, for easy access, fishing camps, things like that. And then the transition to your mills and your hydro dams, which then brought the industry. And then the industry is the indicator of what we discuss mostly today in our present evaluation and analysis of the environmental condition with pollution, um, the pollution being primarily those, the contaminants that, that are referred to as legacy contaminants that, um, you know, the pesticides, organochlorines, PCBs, mercury contamination. And, and those are the, the ones that have concern because of their persistence in the environment and they don't break down readily. But when we're looking at other impacts to what, what's being defined as an area of concern, and I know there's other presenters on this panel that have a much greater detailed knowledge on them, is you know, nutrient loading, bacteria, um, aquatic invasive species. But when we talk about how the integration of cultural use of the resources, when we look at the loss of wetlands and, and other uh, Mohawk traditional plants that are used for medicinal uses, traditional food consumption, and, and what that means to um, an integration of, of a fear by the people as, you know, if their medicines are, are contaminated, if the river and their fish are contaminated, what does that mean for how they interpret the, it's as a personal attack on their, their own lifestyle and traditions? And we heard that um, a few minutes ago of, of that fear and that fear of, you know, how do we, how do we respond in our community culture or protection of our own family when there's you know dirty water and dirty air all around us. So the present is we're evaluating those impacts, we're uh, doing the studies, where just real quick, these are just a couple pictures of the dredging units that are actually on the Lower Grass River right now. So it's turned into a bit of a, a very construction zone area, but that is done in terms to effectively remove risk. And so as we move into the future, the, the important part is, you know, how do we better integrate those Mohawk cultural use metrics and those, those indicator species that are outlined in the traditional teachings and the stories and the species that are important for consumption that, that may not be a, a species that's typically monitored, such as medicinal plants or, or uh, lake sturgeon that is, isn't usually monitored for those things, but yet there's there's fish consumption advisories for those, those species. And then as we continue with the, the clean resources, how do we better revitalize um, cultural use in, with a restored river and habitat resource? So that's in a very quick way, trying to summarize about 30 to 50 years of at least current work and 10,000 years of history <laughs> for the next presenter, Ms. Sateyogo. Thank you so much, Jessica. 
And yes, I would like to now turn to Sate Okwan. My name is Sate Okwan, as I mentioned. I don't even know how to follow that, you know? <laughs> I was hoping I, it would just come to me. So I guess I'll start by going back and this kind of ties to Yagotni um, Kuntliosta. Um, she mentioned the Akwazasne Freedom School. I, I'm a Freedom School alumni. Uh, it's where I think I got my interest and passion for cult or culture or Geha culture and language. It always kind of stuck with me. Um, I find our language to be very complicated and difficult, but, I've, but some things are just sticky. Um, and I also went to uh, Syracuse University where I graduated with a bachelor's degree. And I found that even though I was able to do the work I was never really into it. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, textbooks and lectures and all that information, it just didn't stick. It wasn't sticky for me. <laughs> and that's the only way I can really describe it. Um, I went through the motions, you know, like you graduate high school, you go to college. And thankfully they had the Haudenosaunee promise at Syracuse University. So um, it was a great opportunity to have a full scholarship. And so after I graduated there, I kind of bounced around doing different jobs, nothing I was really passionate about until um, the Akwazasne Cultural Restoration Program did a call out for apprentices. And I applied as a traditional medicine and healing apprentice. And thankfully, they, they chose me. So for four years, I worked with um, two masters, Alicia Cook and Louise Hearn um, for the first year. And then Ernest David came in for the final years. And I learned so much and I'm so thankful for that opportunity. And the Akwazasne Culture Restoration Program or ACR as um, I, I call it, as it's known, it came out of the, the contamination within the area because of the contamination, as um, Yogo Nigugliosta mentioned, there was a fear, or, and Jessica mentioned, there was a fear of all the contamination, how it's affecting our health, so our people stopped fishing, and we were a fishing community. That was our livelihood. Our diet um, depended on it as well, and so it changed a lot of people's professional lives, recreational, their health. Um, people stopped gardening because they didn't trust the soil. They stopped gathering medicines because they didn't trust that they would, you know, make their pe our people feel better. What if they made them feel worse? Um, they stopped hunting and trapping. And so when the program was created, they, they identified these areas that were impacted the most. And because we were no longer doing those traditional activities, we were also no longer using the language that went along with it. And so for those four years, I learned a lot about the other categories, the fishing and water usage, hunting and trapping, traditional foods and horticulture, um, and then my category of the traditional healing and medicines. Um, is where I really focused on, but I had to know a little bit about all the other ones because they're all connected. You know, some fish are medicine, food is medicine. Um, you know, we utilize some of the animal parts in medicine as well. And so that's really where I got my start on focusing on like my medicines and healing. And so after the program, I decided I didn't want to go back to one of my jobs that I was not happy with. I, so I created my own business, Snipe Clan Botanicals. And I also started working with Jessica Jock um, as a contractor. I just felt like the business and the contracting work went hand in hand. Um, you know, making medicines and providing education on how to use the medicines to our community, while also working with Jessica at the Environment Division and 
the remediation efforts that they're going through working with DEC and EPA and making sure that they keep in mind um, the importance of Mohawk traditional use. And moving forward, um, or actually right now, it's been pretty groundbreaking. You know, we've had, um, I mean, Jessica could probably tell you more about this, or maybe we'll do this in discussion, but you know, we're, we're making these steps forward and being included into these areas of decision making where we haven't, Akuzasna hasn't been before, or even Ngwehunwe or natives haven't really been participating at that table. But now we're, we're going out and collecting data. We did a survey along the river, the Grass River, and surveyed all of the plants. Um, utilize that information to propose, you know, how they should be cleaning up the river, what plants should be replanted, and hopefully um, bring back the people of Akwazasne to those traditional areas where, you know, our great grandparents, um, our ancestors used to go to gather and collect medicines. Um, but because of the contamination, we stopped. But after all this work, that's one of my goals or um, or I hope to see is that our people go back to some of those areas and they start to go back to those traditional practices. Um, and I think after this pandemic that got everybody, you know, buying toilet paper, <laughs> they also started gardening. Um, and I think that's one of the first steps and that's really going to push people to go back to our roots and start planting our traditional foods, start gathering our traditional medicines, start hunting and fishing again. And I really hope that we can go with this momentum and continue to teach and continue to learn. And we're at a pivotal moment in time because a lot of our knowledge holders, they're our elders and you know, it's sad they pass away and we need to really work really hard to keep some of this knowledge alive. And that was one of the things that I learned from the cultural restoration program is some of these, you know, these stories going and talk with our elders and our different medicine, um, medicine people, um, you know, how to, how do we use our traditional medicines? What are the names? What are the, the protocols and the, you know, the proper picking and handling and administering and how do you do all these things in a respectful manner. And that's just something that I think is going to, it is very important. And I think it, other people are going to start realizing that and that they are realizing it. And I'm just so thankful that there's these um, panels like this where we can talk about these types of you know, issues or just topics in general and have this discussion. And I think this is really gonna help push forward that momentum into everything we need to do. Um, and I hope I continue my work with Jessica as much as I can. <laughs> I have a 10 month old daughter. So sometimes doing all these things is a little uh, overwhelming being a first time mom. <laughs> I'm sure some of you out there will understand, um, but that's also why I'm, trying so hard to stick with my language and go out and you know plant my gardens and my medicines you know we don't always know know what we're doing at the time but you know we're going to just keep going because that's we're doing the best that we can and i hope that i can make a better world for my daughter because growing up on the saint regis river you know my grandmother was born on saint regis island that the house that she lived in or that she was born in is still there today. And we go out to the island and, you know, put my daughter in her little life jacket, we hop on a boat and it's kind of a, a natural everyday thing for her. We don't do it every day, but it's, it's becoming natural for her. So just as much as I was on the river, I hope she is. And I hope it's going to be just as clean where she will be able to swim in it when she's older. And, you know, I hope my grandkids will be able to swim in that river like we are today. So I just want to thank everybody for this time and every, our panelists are just great and I can't wait to hear the discussion. So I'll, um, I'll stop there and
get it back to Sandhya. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lefe Yokon. Um, so to move on, I think we can turn to Lee Wilbanks. Thank you, Sandhya. Um, so for me to talk about my relationship with uh, the Great River and with waterways in general, uh, it's, it's pretty obvious that, that mine truly is uh, likely a settler's tale, um, quite colonial in, in its background, but uh, someone else has mentioned that uh, they're on a journey I think I have been too. Um, and maybe I'll start with what I think is the punchline and then work my way back to it at the end. Um, and, and the punchline came to me when I was preparing for another presentation a few years ago. Um, and I came across uh, a report from the UN, a, a high level panel on water. And after lots of meetings, lots of research, they sort of summed up the value of water in three words. Uh, it's precious, it's fragile, uh, and it's dangerous. And, and, and that truly is where I think I've come to see water. Um, I grew up in the urban South, but I was fortunate that uh, I was able as a kid to spend a lot of time on the water, the rivers and streams in, in rural Alabama. And totally unconsciously, uh, I, I experienced the preciousness of water that I think all of us still feel. And you hear weaving through the stories of, of the, the, the people are saying tonight that uh, what it means to us when we're on it, when we're near it, when we experience it. Uh, I just, as a kid, didn't, it didn't raise to my consciousness. Um, years later, I, I moved to the North and become an attorney and, and have a joint degree, law degree and master's in public administration. And for many years, um, I, I worked as an environmental attorney for an independent power producer. And I think, again, probably unconsciously uh, became quite attuned to the fragility of water because I worked for a company that at least was decent in their approach. And we wanted to protect the source, the, what, the water we were using, and, but we were using it and it was, uh, a resource and a commodity for us. It was something uh, we knew there were limits to what we could do and we tried to stay within those and we were fairly successful, but it still, uh, once it went through the process, it didn't go out and return the same way that uh, we had gotten it. Um, later, I, I worked as a chief of staff for a New York State Senator whose district included most of the, the Great River and the watershed and a lot of the Eastern Shore of Lake Ontario. Um, and boy, that was, that was an eye-opening experience where the complexity of all of the competing interests uh, that you can imagine we have in water from riparians to uh, industry to drinking water uh, and so on became very apparent. And, and I guess as a culminating experience um, and probably the most satisfying was the six years that I recently spent um, as the river keeper for the upper St. Lawrence River. Um, and, and perhaps as an aside, but as a real critical piece to my development was the fact that I, was, I met and was schooled by uh, a wide range of people, advocates, uh, scientists, um, indigenous and First Nations leaders who all have a perspective on the river. Um, some of them are panelists tonight, Jessica Jock uh, coming up, uh, Tony David, uh, Michael Twist, uh, Lee, Lee McGahey, but also Henry Lickers, and it, just a, a wide range. Um, and on the other side, I also had uh, frequent uh, and not necessarily always pleasant experiences with uh, the principal users of the river as a resource as I had once done. Um, and I guess, you know, 
large among those were the shippers and the Seaway Development Corporation, um, who have, I think, consciously and, and in a very uh, decided way, rebranded our river as Highway H2O, which basically has reduced it to infrastructure. Um, our, and much like the highways of the past, uh, it's allowed them to litter it with uh, a tremendous range of non-native and in, invasive species uh, that are doing great harm to uh, the species that, that we rely on that have always been part of the river and part of the culture here. Um, and of course, the dams that uh, enable that shipping to occur on the scale that it does um, clearly have shown the dangerousness of water and the, and the inability of us to build a structure that controls the water in a way that protects us from um, the harms that can come from it. Um, but you know, it was it was through working with other water keepers from all over the world and, and advocates um, far and wide, many of whom were dealing with more immediate, uh, more intense threats uh, that I realized how quickly uh, a body of water can be fouled. And we've heard mention of some of those already tonight, uh, lead in Flint, Michigan's water from just uh, thoughtless change to save money. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit about the threat of industrial agriculture and what that means uh, to waterways. Uh, climate change, what's happening to the, the temperature of our waters uh, and you know excessive nutrient runoffs and the combination leading to harm, harmful al algal blooms. So I think we're at a pivotal moment. Um, I think we're at a, a moment where we all have a choice. And so sort of, I guess, to put a bow on this and say where I am right now, I'm going to go back to the precious, fragile, and dangerous. And that's been informed by all the times that I've been uh, lucky enough to sit through the words that come before all others. And, and if you listen, and fortunately, many times it's been in English so that my untrained ears can understand more of what's going on. Um, water is, is a key part of that. And, and everything else that's mentioned, whether it's animate or inanimate, is equal. We're all just on a plane. It's not a resource. It's not a commodity. It's just uh, equal. And, and I think our relationship with all those other things, but also more particularly with water, it has to be based on that equality uh, or we're not going to get it right. And I think uh, we have to work at it because if we don't, we're not going to keep water precious, uh, we're not going to protect its fragility, and we're certainly not going to learn how to live with uh, its dangerousness. Um, and I guess that's where I'll stop. Thank you so much, Lee. Um, thank you. And so our, our final speaker for this evening is Shane Rogers. So I'll turn it to Shane. Thank you. I, so that was really a great introduction, actually. Um, and thank you, Lee, for setting up some of the things that, that I'm going to want to talk about a little bit tonight. Uh, you know, before we had this, uh, this, this session or before we came together tonight, um, we had an opportunity for each of us to meet each other and to learn about our, our past experiences with this place in the watershed. And, and um, you know, I, I listened to other people, you know, explain their connections and their histories and their experiences. And, you know, I, I kept circling back to, man, I'm such a settler here. <laughs> For holy smokes, uh, you know, I, I came here from another place. Um, you know, I, I, you know, several years back, I got a, a subscription to Ancestry.com. And, you know, uh, if you've ever had that before the DNA stuff happened, then you know, you know, it's a lot of hard work. You go back and forth through that. You trace through old, you know, phone records and phone books and, and uh, you know, uh, old Quaker meeting minutes and all those things. And it's, you know, it's crazy what you find. But 
uh, you know, my family, you know, we're, we're just the classic settlers. You know, we came from, it turns out, Western Europe. And, uh, you know, we settled, oddly enough, through, through New York State um, in Pennsylvania back in the 1700s was the earliest I could get back. Uh, you know, and then another wave of Irish and Danes coming through in the 1800s. And, you know, and, and those groups, they moved west, um, both to the north and to the south. Um, you know, over until the, around the late 1800s when they ended up in Iowa. And so that's, you know, that's where I come from. Um, but, you know, what makes it worse is that here I am back in New York. So I'm not just a, a settler, I'm a resettler of the area, uh, which, is, which is horrible. Uh, but, uh, you know, it made me think about a lot of things. And so one of the things, uh, you know, as, as I was thinking about this, it, it kind of came up is that, you know, we have this, this oral history. I, I'm, I know a lot of other families have an oral history that kind of co-ops uh, Native American heritage and, and uh, that's been around in my family for a really long time, you know, and I could go through the ancestry.com and I could explore things. I could trace my past. It's like, you know, I'd see we're colonizing from here and there and, and all that sort of thing. And, and this day came when, you know, they have the DNA testing. And so you can go and get your DNA tested and, and for sure, nothing there. We're definitely not Native American. You know, I can take that to my dad and say, hey, you know, we're not, this is not us, dad. You know, this, I know you like the story, but it's not us. And, uh, you know, and he, he got super angry and still doesn't want to believe it, you know, and and, uh, you know, it's one of those stories where I think there, you know, there became a time when that became something romantic and, and it's, it's a strange co-opting that happened. And, you know, my, my grandmother kind of shared that story with him. My grandmother um, shared a story of my grandfather not being able to talk about these things. And, and uh, you know, and so that, uh, because it was through his family line and you know, and I was probably the closest to my um, grandfather. And, you know, and oddly going through the ancestry stuff, I could trace back. I mean, there's this choice, you know, it's like either this is um, connection where his, his grandfather or my great, great grandfather was Native American or this other guy from Ohio, you know, that settled is like, oh, I've got the DNA of this. I kind of know where this goes to, you know. Um, but after all of this, you know, um, and even, even remembering my grandpa, who I was really close with, I asked him one time, he never talked to anybody ever about it. Uh, and he, one time when he was very old, um, it was his last year of life, and I asked him about it. And um, he covered the, he had a, a breathing tube inserted uh, in, his, in his later years, he had cancer. And he covered it up and he mouthed the word Choctaw. And I had no idea what that meant. I'm like, okay, I don't know. Uh, as it turns out, Ancestry.com has now updated their DNA database, and sure enough, there exists that link. Now, I'm not here to say I'm like claiming that. Definitely have no histories in my family that would ever like I had no connection to any of that anymore. Although, um, what I think is interesting and important is that uh, we're here talking about all these things and our connection to the land and we're going to talk about science. We're going to talk about uh, engineering and what we could be doing and what's been done up until this point. And I think one thing that, that I reflected on going through this process was uh, you, who creates the science? Who creates the truth that we know? And, you know, who's, who's excluded from that creation, from the story that we're telling each other. And when you think about something like Ancestry.com where the DNA is being, the records are being created and we're learning about our family histories, who's, who are the people taking those tests? Uh, who can afford those tests? Where, you know, where is that information coming from? And I think that's a really critical thing to think about as we're moving forward tonight. Who's created our truth about what is possible, uh, about what we can do? And uh, how, do we, how do we put that in check, you know? Uh, how do we change that um, so that, you know, we can imagine something that's better than what we have right now? Uh, and so one, one thing that I think, um, moving back to the conversation, uh, I grew up in Iowa. And so I, I saw, uh, it's a very large agriculture state, of course. And I saw a lot of, uh, of my friends and farms, uh, a lot of their families, 
being impacted throughout the 70s and 80s with the farm crisis. And I saw the move towards, you know, industrialized agriculture that's pervasive uh, in the state. And I became interested in these sorts of things. And so uh, when I went and got my degree uh, in environmental engineering, and I had to make a decision, where am I going to go next? Uh, I decided to chase that pathway down and you know, went towards the EPA so that I could work on problems with large scale agriculture. So in that work, uh, very early on, uh, I, as, as I was starting to um, learn more about how things were created, I started to learn about how industry had infiltrated into the creation of agriculture and how it created a story around what was possible and what was not possible, importantly, uh, and how we should do agriculture versus how agriculture had been historically done. This picture is a result of, of that interaction. And, and what you're looking at here is an, an aerial, a satellite image, and overlaid on that satellite image is the 100-year floodplain. Uh, this happens to be from North Carolina, so this is a place where I've done some work. And you can see some, here some large hog farms. So these, this, this particular farm has several thousand hogs and in each one of these buildings is a little over a thousand hogs. Packed in so tight that when they reach full weight, they literally stand shoulder to shoulder with on their concrete pens and their, on their slatted floors. And all the waste that they produce gets flushed out into this large open pit. And that's flushed by taking the, the liquid that's in this large open pit and flushing it through the hog houses to take the, that uh, feces, that excrement, back out into this pit where it just decays and produces such a massive stench that you can hardly bear it if you stand next to these. Uh, and the industry will, will promote the idea that this doesn't smell, uh, that this is safe. You can see the, the 100 year floodplain. We live in an age where we have a changing global climate, where we have increasing frequency of flooding, uh, increasing uh, frequency of, of damage, and, and this place where we have, you know, 100-year floods at the same farm, you can see what happens. This is not a 100-year flood that's occurring, but you can see what's happened. Very unfortunately, uh, this lagoon was in, in a recent hurricane over Topple. And so uh, some of its lagoon materials came out. What interaction does that have? What does this have for the people who live next to this? You know, these people that live here, who are the people that live here? Poor, non-white predominantly, people who have no power uh, to overcome these things. Who are the people that live with this in their neighborhood, who live with this in this water situation in their community? What, what can we do, you know, to prevent this? The industry would have you think that things like this are not possible. That they're, that they're not economically viable. Yet this fella, um, this anaerobic digester here, and you can see in the background solar panels, he does this. There's no reason why anybody else can't. Uh, you know, so do we believe in those? Do we believe when we hear these kind of things? What, what can we do that's different? Um, this guy, when the power goes out in his neighborhood, he turns it on for a couple hundred uh, residences in his neighborhood using the, the gas that's produced in his digester, using his solar panels and his microgrid system. Why can't we reimagine our place into something like that? You know, I just want us thinking about some of these issues um, in a different way. Uh, you know, what's on the horizon? You know, we, we may not be facing some of these here right at this very moment. Are we trending towards those things? What can we do to, to stave those off? And, uh, and what, how can we reimagine the way we do our things to do something better? So with that, I'm just going to turn it back. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shane. And, and thank you to all of the panelists. Um, you know, I have to say my job as moderator, well, when I started off, I said this whole process is as part of my learning experience. And so that's exactly what's happened this evening. Um, and I think my job as moderator was try to, to try to keep time, but I also felt like I couldn't because the words that were being shared were so impactful, so profound and so important to the conversation. So we've totally gone over, but we also, um, you know, we'll also make time and make space for some conversation and for discussion. So for those of you who are joining us on Zoom or through the Weave News, if you're on Zoom, 
please post um, any questions that you might have for any of the panelists using the Q&A feature. And for those of you joining through the Weave News, um, use the link on YouTube. Um, but I guess maybe I will start while I wait for any questions to come on in. Um, and so I thought, you know, one of the questions I asked us all to think about was to reflect on the future um, and to reflect on the future of the water watershed. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'll just ask this question broadly. What are some key issues that you see that we need to think about in terms of the future? How we can imagine solutions uh, to create this more just, life-sustaining, regenerative relationship with the water? Um, so I will put that question out there broadly and, and, and see who picks it up. Um, what, are, what are our thoughts about the future? I'd like to take on that question. And the reason I'd like to take it on is because my family's been affected by the, the whole watershed. And um, we were probably the last holdout, probably one of the last farms. And then just recently, we were one of the last people on, in our area to uh, have a well. Everybody was basically uh, forced into doing a water line because um, the water in, in our, our part of, of Akwazasne, uh, a lot of people felt it was contaminated and, and they were unfortunately not able to um, connect toward their well. Well, we kept on our well for a long time until it was finally to the point that our well um, couldn't be cleaned anymore. Uh, you could put as much Clorox down there as you want it and as often as you want it. And after a while, it just wouldn't get cleaned anymore. So we had to, um, we had to finally get onto the water system and that water system is directly coming from the St. Lawrence River. And I have talked to environmentalists on both sides and even though we have probably the most up-to-date um, uh, water cleaning plants, the problem is, is that yes, it can clean out lots of um, debris, it can clean out uh, bacteria, but it can't, it can't clean out heavy metals. And the heavy metals are, are probably still in the water. I think that in the future, we have to really um, ramp it up a little bit so that we don't have to be afraid of the heavy chemicals that are in the water. Also, what we need to do al along the whole St. Lawrence River is to figure out a way that sewage can be treated before it is put back into the water system. Most of the bus in our community don't have, we aren't part of a, a joint sewage cleaning system before it goes back into the river. Or some people are always worried that the sewage treatment plants that we have are overflowing before it goes back into the river. So everybody is always very conscious of how clean or how dirty the water is. So I think that our future, hopefully we, come, we, we have throughout the whole community, we have a sewage system that uh, works and that it doesn't um, pollute the river before the water goes back into, the, into that system. Um, that's what I would like to see uh, in, in my district and, and throughout Akwazasne. But um, all of those river, uh, everything from Love Canal all the way down the St. Lawrence keeps, just keeps coming and, and it hits Akwazasne and now it's I mean, it must go down to Montreal and everybody screams when Montreal says, we're, we're dumping 50 million gallons of waste into the river and Gahnawaga is all up in arms and everything. I feel like each individual homeowner that is dumping or that they don't have a good septic system and that water eventually hits either the water table or it, it, it flows out into the St. Lawrence is part of the problem, wittingly or unwittingly. A friend of mine once said, Every snowflake denies its capability, culpability in, a, in an avalanche. And I think that if we all open our eyes and see how we are culpable in the problem, maybe it's time for us to start taking responsibility and find a way to clean it up. Because um, it, it's like Sofiogo said, our next generation keeps happening. We just keep bringing more and more beautiful babies and we owe it to them to make sure that the land is clean. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any anybody else wants to speak to this question about the future? Yeah, I'll just well, Yoko Nikolhiosta was saying, you know, we always got to keep in mind our future generations. You know, like I personally, you know, I think about my my family, my daughter. Um, if my daughter decides to have a family of her own, like are they going to be able to utilize these water various water systems in Akwazasne and what is that going to mean? And it is a lot of work as I watch Jessica um, go through her every day. I, I don't even know what she does every day, but I know she stays really busy and she works really hard to to keep the best interest of Akwazasne in mind. And it is going to take a lot of work and we're going to need people who are both passionate about their culture and language to make sure that it sustains and that we can utilize our natural resources, but also we need, you know, our academics and educators going in and learning and how do we fix the system. So it's just, it's going to be a lot of work. Thank you. Um, I, I see some questions coming into the Q&A, so I'll relay those to our panelists. Um, one question, uh, and I think this is directed to everyone. Since restoration is the focus of all of your work, how do we convince the public to understand this? I, I think that's a great question, and I think as uh, an advocate, it's something we're always struggling with. Um, and sort of going back to your question, um, I may be the the pessimist in the group, but I think at least in the United States as we're seeming to move away from uh, an acceptance of science and reliance on rationality, uh, we, we, uh, we're struggling. I think, uh, you know, I've said this before, we we work in a lot of organizations. We put pretty pictures up and tell people this is what we need to preserve. And I don't think that's been enough. Um, and unfortunately, it's sometimes a flint level event that uh, focuses the mind and people then demand restoration. Uh, you know, it's we've moved away from our original environmental movement, but it was because we were on the brink of disaster. Uh, and the other day, the Cuyahoga burned again. So I, I guess we just have to, um, we have to work. We have to try to get people to realize that uh, whether it's traditional knowledge or uh, Western science, there's a basis and there's a history. And I think it's telling stories, whether it's through art, uh, it's explaining the quilt so that people feel a connection. I've heard the mothers talk uh, to the EPA about the Grass River, and it was one of the most moving things I've heard. Uh, but even then, our government sort of shut them down and took the least cost alternative. Um, but I do think bringing people to the water, making a connection so that they see, feel, and hear the impacts, um, and even though it may be small groups and individuals, uh, that may be the way we have to go. Yeah, I'll just add real quick too. I know later in the whole session of, of this event, I think the last panel includes a watershed approach and what that means. And you even heard today different panelists talk about these um, source related impairments, whether it's agricultural runoff, bacterial toxins, industrial contaminants, <clears throat> even, even personal use sewage um, discharge and, and other, other things. But if the urgency, it's, it's hard because you're constantly putting out the fires like Lee had said, but if there's more of a collaborative approach that the perspective and the lens that I work from is taking on that Haudenosaunee perspective because it's looking at the system holistically and everything together and 
And if you just if you're just focusing on the wetlands, then you're in, and not the water levels, then you're not really addressing the issue. And if you're just looking at one source of contaminants, but not the agriculture, then you're not looking at all the water impacts. And as climate change takes place and water becomes more of an important commodity, we're going to be constantly playing catch up to to try to, you know, respond to those impacts rather than plan. And I, and I know there's another session later on that talks about planning for the watershed in the future. But um, I, I, I think today's session was important to really bring that the Haudenosaunee perspective, the Haudenosaunee and um, the, the stories to, to have that broad picture and integrative collaborative approach. And hopefully, you know, as, as we proceed down this path, we can make better management decisions. Well, if I could add what you just said, Jessica, I have a half formed idea that unfortunately I don't have uh, the resource, the research chops to to put behind it, but uh, working with a, a group of uh, concerned citizens in Cornwall, uh, who formed the Great River Network, it, sitting listening to them, organically look at problems and try to solve them. Um, it's occurred to me that we might try the community garden approach. I mean, the idea that here's, it's not a plot of land but it's, it's the water that we depend on and we all have to, to take care of it in our own way because we're all sharing it with us and everybody downstream. Um, I, I need somebody smarter than I am and with uh, more eloquent to, to develop that out. But I think that couples people, you know, when you put your hands in the dirt, you feel a connection and somehow we have to get people to feel that connection and that urgency there. And, and Jessica I, and, and me, those are like really great points. Um, and, I, and, and that's exactly hitting the nail on the head. And I, I think we live now in a day where, you know, it's, it's been too easy in the past for people to make it somebody else's problem, somebody else's impact, it's not gonna hurt me. It's too easy to move on. And, and we live in a day where we have, a, a, we have the potential to get those stories out so people can, you can personalize the damage that's done, uh, you know, to understand or to connect with the stories of, of people who live with these, to understand that it could happen to you just as easily as it can happen to somebody else. And I think that has to be part of the, the solution. I, I think we see some of that emerging in the pandemic, in, in the situation that we're in now, we see people mobilizing to a greater extent than we've ever seen before because people have the time to be to slow down and to take a look at what's happening and people are spending more time taking a look at what's happening and, and realizing that that can be them as well and i just feel that has to be part of the solution i think that as long as we give people hope that things can get better um that uh, we don't set up our next generation to think that, oh, um, we're so polluted or climate change has happened so fast that they don't have to care anymore. I think you take away hope that you'll take away that part of it that our children need to say, my generation can make a difference and will try to make a difference. We have to always have that in, in, in our teachings for them. In that quilt, when, when, she, when she takes a hold of that soil, she takes that soil and later in the story, it tells us that all life comes from the soil, right? There's life in there. And from that life is what the creator used to make all the other life on earth. When he did that, um, he said uh, that all life coming from the soil will return to the soil. There's balance in almost everything that we do. So if we can teach our children that that soil came from the water, and that soil is so, we are so dependent on it. Like he said, they, they, they have gardens. That's a real good first step. I think that that's what we have to do is, is get our children to touch the soil again, to feel the soil and to feel responsible for it. And, and uh, we need to plant that in them. And hopefully they can help us find those solutions that we need and that they don't lose hope into the future. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, we have many more questions. We also have time constraints. I thought I would ask at least one more question and then we can see where the conversation takes us and then we can decide if it's time for us to wrap things up. Um, and so there was quite a few questions asking about uh, like traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and so one question was, in what ways are traditional ecological knowledge or, or is traditional ecological knowledge um, being utilized and incorporated into the management and ecological restoration efforts? Um, so yes, our traditional knowledge is being kind of incorporated into solutions. So I will try to narrow the focus on maybe one project in the project that Satyoga assisted us with. And so before you can even apply uh, traditional ecological knowledge um, in this context from a Mohawk perspective of traditional use plants uh, for medicine or traditional foods that grow naturally along the river shoreline or in wetlands, you have to know what's there. And, and, and from a scientific perspective, we're familiar with invasive species that have taken over and so your wetlands or your shoreline species have been impacted by so many different anthropogenic uses, whether it's people mowing their lawns, and so now you just have a green lawn, or the wetlands that have been taken over by Phragmites or, or other things like that. And so when we're talking about wetland health or shoreline health and, and a river system, when we went out and did our surveys, we used a different approach. We used again, that Mohawk perspective lens of where, because of the Haudenosaunee teachings, like all plants are important, or if it has a medicinal use or a traditional food use, um, and there are some, there, like cattails, um, ground nut, things like that, that, that have historical records of being consumed traditionally. Um, you know, do they grow there? Are they healthy and abundant? And if not, you know, can we plant them instead of a species that's being grown in a greenhouse, you know, in Ohio, that is, you know, maybe it's a species that's native to the region in the watershed and it can grow in our cold climate, but it doesn't have that, that consumption or that medicinal value that likely has been native and natural in this environment before any other impact. So, so we, we use the scientific approach of trying to understand what, what, what's there, what could be there, what the environment would support for growth, and then the knowledge of historical records, traditional teachings, and medicinal traditional food plant knowledge to say, okay, these are the plants that, that we want to plant, and they also serve an ecological service and a function, whether that service and function is um, you know, just in the wetland itself or the shoreline or it's food for, for muskrat and, and beavers or it serves as, as housing for a beaver or it's, it's used as, as food for, for people. So um, that's probably the best example I can give and I hope that answers the question. <laughs> um, but, but it's a very integrated approach and it, it takes a long time to, you know, it's not something where, and, and often, you know, another question we always get is, well, can, can you just document this, this traditional ecological knowledge and just share it? It's, but it's, it's that learning in the environment with the language, because the language is, is part of the knowledge. The language has a whole story that, that associates with it and maybe the use of that, that plant or that animal. And then um, and some of the, the practices of the collection and the ceremony and the purpose like that. And so, so it's not as easy as just give me a list and we can integrate this everywhere. It's, it's, it's a whole learning process and, and, and application. Yeah, and it is important and it does benefit and the, like the science side, um, but there is always that difficulty between the traditional knowledge is always more um, qualitative and then the science is more quantitative mm -hmm. and we're always back and forth well can you just give me a list of numbers um, of plants that you want and it's it gets a little hard or how do you how do you make a survey for the community about what they want to eat or what medicines they used to see or about the different stories that their grandparents used to tell about 
fishing or being on the river, um, how do you how do you quantify that type of traditional knowledge? How do you quantify something that's traditionally passed on orally, you know, through stories? And while it is difficult to navigate those two paths side by side, it is very important because it does add so much more to that information and to the experience. And working with um, Jessica, we've done um, work along the Grass River with the remediation efforts. Um, I've also been a part of the, um, the plant nursery group um, that the uh, SRMT, San Francisco Mohawk Tribes Environment Division um, has started. Um, just to see, you know, what type of plants do we want grown? You know, is it going to be the typical food plants that every other greenhouse has? Or are we going to go with traditional plant medicines, traditional plant foods, or fruit and nut trees for the health of the community? Uh, we're even doing, you know, area of concerns and um, BUIs, you know. I'm, I won't get into the acronyms. I'm not the science person. Mm -hmm. I'm the traditional ecological knowledge holder. <laughs> and that was only because I, you know, I grew up here. I went to the Freedom School where I learned um, a lot of, you know, things you don't necessarily realize are important because, you know, you're like five to 10 years old. Um, and it's just something that's ingrained you hear around the community. I learned at ACR program. So everything that I've gathered, all this knowledge I've collected over the years, I try to utilize that in the conversations that they have. When they get all sciencey, I try to participate by saying, well, you know, this reminds me of this story that I once heard about, you know, creation story, or it ties to the great law and how we function today. Um, and so it's, difficult because a lot of that knowledge um, you have to be careful how how you share it or if you even share it. and so there's it takes a lot of a lot of work and I'm really thankful that you know I have support like Jessica and uh, other other community members who are just just great at what they do so it makes those conversations flow and we incorporate that inf information as best we can into um, the science side of of these these projects and restoration efforts. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for your um, both of your responses. Um, so I think at this point I, I had two more questions I thought we could use as kind of like a closing moment or a closing conversation. Um, so I'm just going to pair these two questions. So one person asks, um, in what ways can people support the Mohawks of Akwesasne and this restorative effort? And then the second question, this comes to us from uh, someone writing from Mexico. And they say, you know, my question is, how can we support each other? How can we break the border to support? We must maintain the consciousness that we are a part of a world where we inhabit with vital elements for our existence. Um, I would like to receive material to better understand the subject and to be able to give my support. Thank you very much. Um, and so I thought maybe we could reflect on that and speak to that as a way to close, <laughs> thinking about how can we support each other, um, support the Mohawk community, um, but then also support more broadly. So would anybody like to pick that one up? <laughs> Yes, I'd like to um, just say that people talk about um, nowadays, they seem to understand what it is to be politically woke, right? You're conscious of everything that's going on around you politically and, and you're trying to do something about it. Well, you, we also need to be environmentally woke. We need to teach our people um, and our, our children especially that they have to consider everything that they do um, in relation in relationship to each other and that we live within a network of, we live within a system called the mother earth and that everything affects each other. And so, yes, we have to reach across the border. The St. Lawrence river is a prime example of us having to reach across that border to be able to, because the water doesn't recognize that border. 
um, I think if we can teach each other to every decision that we have to make, we have to consider the environment, whether we choose plastic or glass, whether we uh, use one, one system or another system to that they have to be conscious. And as much as they can be conscious, that's where your traditional not ecological knowledge will come into play. You make the decision that is best for the most instead of what is just best for me. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to the Ohandagalihwadekwa, you know, that's something that supports all of us. You know, if you take us as human beings out of this world, everything else would thrive. And so as human beings, like it's our, care, it's our duty as caretakers of this earth to make sure that there is something still here for our future generations and so going back to what Yagot Nikolhiosta was saying, you know, how, how do we support the Mohawks of Akpazosna or how do we support one another? It's, you know, going back to acknowledging and being respectful to all those things that are out in nature that um, I recited in the Ohanda Galiva Dekwa. You know, it's all very important and it's the one thing that connects all of us, you know, through borders, through, you know, cross cultures, it connects all of us, you know, it doesn't matter where we come from, we all depend on all those things. Yeah, and I would just suggest that um, if, if people are really interested to, to assist, you know, in, in, a, in some sort of way, I think reading and learning, you know, the history of different indigenous communities, there's over 500 and some federally recognized tribes in the U.S. borders alone. And so each tribe interacts differently or they have different, they have similar but different creation stories, different um, environmental uses, resources, things like that. And so sometimes just becoming aware of who your neighbors are. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, I grew up in a community just adjacent to Akwesasne. So I was familiar through my childhood but I didn't really learn about Akwazasni until I had a professional job working for the community. And, you know, sometimes it was, it's, it's like this awareness of, wow, like there's this community right next door that is perceiving a, uh, the environment in a different lens or, or look or is impacted in a different way than just another community five, 10 miles down the road. And, and sometimes it's just an awareness. And I think, you know, there's, there's enough indigenous communities around North America that I, I think if you just look around to see who your neighbors are and, just, and to see like how maybe that, that self-awareness and community culture awareness um, could help even just locally for yourselves, so. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that question? Um, I, I think, you know, communication, um, if we need to communicate, we need to share our knowledge. Um, we need to accept that we're all connected. We need to listen uh, to each other's stories, uh, listen to uh, the knowledge that may be gained in one place and try to figure out how that might be useful for somewhere else um, while respecting what knowledge is there. Um, working, working globally on water problems, I, I find that oftentimes uh, the knowledge exists uh, within the communities that I work with, but, uh, but sometimes it's just lost among, the own, the, among that own community uh, because, you know, they've gone through a process where we're constantly fed what's in the media, we're constantly fed what's, you know, the industrial machine tells us and, and uh, and so those things that work and that have worked for years, uh, you know, we're taught sometimes that, that they're not good. And, you know, as I was reflecting back on one of the, the traditional knowledge kind of areas, I was working on a water project in Ecuador and we were asking the community, we had all these ideas for how we could bring, you know, clean water into the community and work, you know, and do those things. And we were just talking with them about you know, here's some different ideas. And, and somebody finally spoke up and said, you know, I really like this one um, because it reminds me when we had, you know, this, this old guy, you know, that lived you know, down, the, down the road here and he used to filter all this water through this rock. 
and it was so good and he never got sick and it was always, you know, um, always very clean. And it turns out, you know, they're in a volcanic region. And, and the only thing I can guess, it was maybe like the pumice. And, and so this led us towards um, creating ceramic water filters for the community because that's something that they were familiar with, something that they would use, something that works. And, uh, you know, working in Africa, um, very similar, you know, we have community um, stretch looking for ways to get clean water and, and um, you know, they want to use uh, a surface water source because that's what the National Water and Sewerage Company does. They go in and they do a surface water source and they make a big expensive water treatment plant and then water comes to the community. But at the same time, uh, you know, we've, we've found people who still dig wells in a traditional well, in a traditional way. And uh, it's not a way that I would ever have imagined myself because I've never seen it before. But to see, you know, two guys dig a well 60 some feet down under the ground and, and um, put that together. And, and now we're, you know, for, for between six and $10,000, we can put in a groundwater well that serves a thousand people, you know, for many, many years. So even if it only worked for 10 years, you know, with the solar pump and everything on it, uh, it's like a dollar for everybody to get water for 10 years. It's amazing. And we would never have thought about that had we not went in and, and listened and watched and learned something, but then also help them by applying our knowledge. How do we, you know, put power here to make a, a pump that works, you know, so we can put in a solar system and, and make that work for you as well. And so um, communication, I think, is really key in, in opening those conversations up between different places and, and, and thinking about things respectfully and, and acknowledging the knowledge that's there and working with it. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, with that, I personally want to extend my gratitude to uh, Sing Soon and Blake for organizing this, but especially to this, all of the panelists here. Um, and this is coming from me. I'm sure it's also going to come from everybody on Zoom and uh, who's joining us on the Weave. But this was very enriching, very enlightening, and it's, it's part of my life learning. So a uh, sincere thank you to everyone and for your for sharing your um, knowledge. Um, so I think at this point, I will turn it back to Sinsun and Blake. I don't... Number one, again, just echoing with everything Sandy has said, sincere gratitude towards all of you for everything that you shared with us, shared with the people that are in the panel, shared with the world. All the knowledge is just still percolating through me. I still feel it flowing. And it's still making these connections, and I'm sure it's making connections for everyone who has had the great, well, was lucky enough to be watching you speak, you share, to be listening to your words. So thank you. Yeah, thank you really for your words and your time and sharing all your knowledge. And also we want to thank the audience for all your question and contributions. So I think this is a wrap up. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing night. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists. Yeah, well, yeah, well.